Hey there, thank you so much for joining me. Today I'm going to show you how I made this lovely mountain soap. This technique is called sculptured layers and to sculpt these layers I used soap shapers from Belinda Williams of Love Your Suds. And then to continue that majestic feel that mountains evoke, I decided to scent this soap with spiritual awakening fragrance oil which is from Nature's Garden. These soaps are available for sale in my shop for a limited time so please consider taking a look and buying some before they're gone. Check out the description. I leave links for Belinda's Love Your Suds where I got the soap shapers and also the indigo color and Nature's Garden where I got the fragrance. Then if you're interested in buying some soap for my shop I have that link as well. Stay tuned to the end of the video where I give a few tips and let you know what I would have done differently. If you're new to soap making, know that this is an advanced technique that requires lots of math to pull this off. So I would suggest starting with something a little easier and working your way up to something like this. Layer soaps require dividing the lye solution several times. This requires caution, precision, and also presence of mind. So you really need to know what you're doing. Okay, I'm done with all the housekeeping. My name is Terry from Tree Marie Soapworks and let's get started. Before I begin, I'm going to make sure and note the weight of my bowl. I need to know that so that I can calculate the contents of the bowl later on. I'm going to start with the oils instead of the lye solution. If you know my other videos, I always do that first to get it cooling, but today I'm going to start with the oils. So coconut oils first, I microwave that until it's completely melted, and I use 30 second bursts or so to get it melted. And I don't want it too hot, but I want it to be completely melted. Here I'm measuring the cocoa butter into the melted coconut oil. I like to stir that until it's melted and if I can't quite get it melted by that residual heat from the coconut oil, I will microwave it very gently. I use 15 second bursts, taking care not to heat it up too much. Once that's melted, I add the remaining liquid oils. First the castor oil, then the avocado oil, and finally the olive oil. One thing to note is that I'm using indigo to color this batch and it's recommended not to use palm oil with indigo so this is a palm free recipe. Two more ingredients I want to add to the oils before we split them apart. I have kale and clay. I'm using that at a rate of one teaspoon per pound of oils and then also the fragrance. And as I said earlier, I'm using spiritual awakening fragrance and that's from nature's garden. I'm adding the fragrance to the oils now to simplify things a bit. Another way you could do it is to add it as you prepare each layer individually, but by adding it to the oils now, it gets distributed more evenly. Also, you don't run into the risk of forgetting to add it to a layer. Next, I hand stir until most of the clay is under the surface. And then I carefully stick blend the mixture. This is your chance to make sure that the clay is incorporated. So give it a good blend, but don't get too crazy. It's easy to blend in a bit of air and once it's in there, it's really difficult to get rid of. Next, to calculate the weight of what's in the bowl, I weigh the bowl and the contents. Then I subtract the bowl's weight, which I recorded earlier. And from that, I just calculate the percentages that I need for each layer. So while I have been doing my calculations, I assume that the clay has probably settled a bit. So I give it a good blend before I do the dividing to make sure it's still well dispersed and gets evenly distributed through each one of these layers. Next, I divide the oil solution into the proper percentages for each of the five layers. I start with the bottom layer as layer number one since it goes into the mold first. Now let's move on to the lye solution. Typically in layer soap designs, I make up the lye solution and divide it once it's cooled. But today I'm adding the indigo colorant directly to the lye solution. Since each layer has less indigo than the previous layer, I'm making up different lye solutions for each layer. This natural indigo colorant is from Love Your Suds. It's a beautiful shade of blue. In fact, when I compare it to the other indigo that I have on hand, it's much bluer than the grayer hues from the other suppliers. Before we move on, I want to tell you that making the lye solution in a glass container isn't ideal. 
The reason why I use these beakers is that they have pore spouts. If you've seen my marble soap making video, I use polypropylene cups to divide the lye solution, but they can make quite a mess since they don't have pore spouts, and that's the last thing you want when dealing with a caustic substance. So instead I opted for a pore spout, and I did account for any breakage that might happen by making it in a container, which would have been better if I would have placed it on some kind of tray, because as it stands now, it's not movable since it's only made of silicone. I didn't have any breakage here, however, I have had these beakers break for seemingly no reason, so I was lucky here. In the future, I'm either going to get some small stainless steel pitchers or try and make pour spouts for my polypropylene cups, so stay tuned for that. Here I'm adding the sodium lactate. I usually use teaspoons, but I've converted it to milliliters since we're dealing with such a small amount, and I just drop it in using a pipette. Before I start my first pour, I need to check that my sculpting tools are prepared with the guides positioned at the proper height. I use clear tape for this, however, I found out on this one that it's much better to use something a little stronger than scotch tape or packaging tape. So on my next ones, I use crystal clear Gorilla Tape, which stuck much better. Now this takes a bit of time, so as you watch, I will give you a few tips and tricks and things that I've learned along the way. Off camera, I prepared the first layer by adding the lye solution to the oil solution. And once it's at medium trace, I poured it and then I waited for it to get thick enough to hold a design. It's best to use a fragrance that slightly accelerates for layer soap because you could have quite a long wait in between your pores. So as you find fragrances that slightly accelerate, note that they would be great for layer soaps. This spiritual awakening fragrance was actually pretty well behaved, so I did have to wait a bit in between layers. This leads me to another tip. Make sure you've cleared plenty of time to work on this because if your layers don't set up quickly, if you see this other batch, it looks good from the picture here, but that top layer is a little bit more grainy and not as smooth of a consistency. And the reason why is that I got in a rush. As I was scraping that peach colored layer, I decided to go ahead and mix up the top layer just to get ahead of things. I wanted that layer to thicken up and be ready to pour once I got that peach layer sculpted. Well, that was not a good thing. I realized it because when I cut it, the top was grainy and then I did the same thing on another batch. So it confirmed my suspicions that if you mix up a layer while you're messing around and it has time to just sit there, it turns out more grainy once you've cut it, you'll see the difference. Probably not every fragrance acts that way, but do you really want to chance that when you're making a design that is very time consuming? No, probably not. So devote your undivided attention to each layer individually, and I think you'll have a better result. Since I'm showing you this brown soap, I might as well go ahead and tell you my design idea in this one and how it failed as well. And you can have some pointers on making a one color design with mica lines using soap shapers. My idea was to use no color at all, just use a browning fragrance and then in between each layer make a gold mica line. You'll remember that I mentioned when I was talking about the fragrance to add the fragrance to the oils to simplify things a bit. I didn't do that in this situation and that's where I got that bit of advice because I added the fragrance individually and I think there was a slight variance. It wasn't quite consistent for each layer. So I think between layer one and two, that's what happened. There was a little bit different amount of fragrance or a little bit different of a ratio of fragrance to that amount of soap batter. So if you add your fragrance to the oils and then divide them, I think it would be much more uniform. So I've already discussed the graininess in that layer 3 that was caused by the batter sitting while I was sculpting the previous layer, but this has another issue. It's the mica lines. They're practically invisible. The reason that happened is that this fragrance, though it is a browning fragrance, it doesn't tint the batter right away. The batter was kind of a yellow color and so was the mica. So when I was putting the mica on, I couldn't really see where it had gone and how much I had covered. So in the future, when I make a batch like this, I would tint the batter to some 
tone color so that it doesn't look yellow, something other than yellow. So I would maybe use a little bit of activated charcoal to get it to look a little gray. Then when I would put on the mica, I could see where I had missed and I put enough on to where the batter is covered very well, but I don't put it on to where it looks dry. So my mica needs to look wet and I blow off any excess because if you have dry mica on there, your layers won't stick together. Now let's talk about some ways where you can get your batter to set up a little sooner and so you won't have to deal with impatience like I did. Kaolin clay is an additive that you can use to make your layers set up a little more quickly. I love the quality that clay adds to soap, so I add it whenever possible. I think clay makes soap feel like soap. It gives it that slip. It's great in well-cured bars. I just love it. It's not always ideal to add to soap because sometimes you need your batter to stay fluid for longer. So I would say I only add it probably half the time, but in a design like this, it's a welcomed addition. Another thing to consider when you're formulating your recipe is that you can use more saturated fats than you would typically use for a design that has to stay fluid. In some of my videos, I mentioned that my swirl recipes usually fall around 43% saturated fats and 57% unsaturated fats. For reference, you can find that saturated to unsaturated fat ratio in the upper right hand corner of your soap calc printout. Saturated and unsaturated fats are different than hard and liquid oils. Most of the butters and oils that you would use are made up of a combination of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. For instance, olive oil, you think that it's just unsaturated, but that's not true. It has quite a bit of palminic acid and a little bit of stearic acid, so it's made up of a combination. So just keep that in mind. It's not strictly, this is hard at room temperature, so this is saturated, and this is liquid at room temperature, so this is unsaturated. It doesn't work that way. Also, coconut oil, that's a pretty common ingredient in soap, and it is highly saturated, but there's still some oleic acid in it and a little bit of linoleic acid in it. If you look at your soap calc printout, you see different fatty acids listed. And so the top four are the saturated fats, the lauric, myristic, palmitic, and stearic. And then the bottom four are the unsaturated fats. They are ricinoleic, oleic, linoleic, and linolenic acids. And then there's different degrees of unsaturation and saturation. One of the reasons I prefer to use soap calc as my lie calculator is the way they list these fatty acids. They list them in order that makes sense. It's the most saturated to the least saturated. So lauric acid being the most saturated and linolenic being the least saturated. And when you kind of understand this, you can glean all kinds of information from the numbers that you see there. As I was saying earlier, for my swirls, I make different recipes than for my layer soaps. So for a layer soap, since I want that to set up a little sooner, I would use a little more saturated fats. But to raise the saturated fats, I would stay away from the lauric and myristic acids that you find in coconut oil and palm kernel oil and babasu and things like that. They can be drying, so I would go towards the palmitic and stearic acid to raise your saturation. Butters are high in palmitic and stearic acid, so I would put a little more butter in these kind of recipes. Depending on how your fragrance behaves, you could raise your saturated fats to a little closer to a 50-50 ratio. For this batch, my recipe was a 44 to 56 ratio. I didn't really change it that much because this fragrance was new to me, so I didn't really know how it was going to act. I don't always trust the review because sometimes I've had fragrances act up that nobody else seems to have act up. There's so many variables, so I like to use it for myself and form my own opinion on how it's going to act. So I was very conservative on my recipe for this one. However, if I do it again, I would be less conservative. I would add some more butters because I would like a little less time in between layers. And I would consider using this in a swirl recipe because I had some time to work and true to the description of this spiritual awakening fragrance, it was well behaved and cold process soap. Just a little side note here. I love teaching and I love learning and I love sharing what I've learned, but these videos take a lot to produce. And so if you would be so kind to subscribe, it shows me that you love this kind of content and you want to see more of it and it motivates me to do my best job possible for you.
Also hit the bell for notifications so that you can be notified next time I post a video. And to those of you who have donated through the super thanks button or have bought soap or bought a recipe, I really appreciate it. While we're on the subject of learning and sharing, do you have any ideas for future videos? Is there anything that you just can't understand that I could shed some light on? Or is there a technique that you would like me to feature? I have a lot of video footage that I could turn into videos, but honestly, it's so hard to go back and get excited about it. But something new and fresh is much easier to do. So just let me know if you have some ideas, drop them in the comments below, and I really appreciate that. This is day two when I'm unmolding the soap. Acrylic molds are a little difficult to unmold. I see here I could have probably saved myself some trouble if I would have swiveled it instead of pulling it away from the loaf. I think it would have come off more cleanly. But yes, acrylic molds are a little more difficult to unmold. So I have some cleaning up to do. If I'm honest, this part is really fun for me. I love fixing these bars and making them look like nothing had ever happened. It's kind of therapeutic for me. It's enjoyable, but when there's lots to do, of course, it gets a little tedious and it is not as enjoyable, but I'm always glad I did it. You know, when you have that cured bar and you can't tell that anything ever happened, it's very rewarding and well worth it. For me, the soap is more than just soap. It's art too, so it's nice to get it looking like something you're proud of. So it's another part of soap making that I enjoy. Also along the aesthetics line, another tip is to make sure before you add the next layer that you scrape off the sides and get them all clean because you could have soap from each layer tainting the next layer on the sides and the ends. I used a palette knife and a spatula and you can see here that there's no residual smearing from the previous layers. Another tip that I have for you is to make this in a bigger batch. It's very time consuming and really it's about the same amount of time to make a small batch than to make a big batch. So I was really happy that I made a big batch in this situation. Now, of course, if it doesn't work out, that's a different story. But if you're comfortable with everything, I would make a big batch. These soap shapers are customizable if you order them from Love Your Suds. I had it made for the tall and skinny mold. You can actually have these made for a regular low mold that's horizontal but I had it made for the tall and skinny mold at a two and a half inch mold and it was for my eight inch mold. I love the size of that one and I'm so glad that I remembered that I have this tall and skinny mold that is the same width at two and a half inches and fits this soap shaper as well and that gives me 18 bars and it's the same amount of trouble instead of the eight bars so in the future I would always make it in a large amount and of course I would put into action some of these other tips I had about not rushing the layers so that I can ensure that I have a good product when I'm done. Of course, all that's cosmetic. It doesn't really matter in the long run, but aesthetically, it's just more pleasing if you don't have grainy layers. Here, I planed off the top of the loaf because it got a little bumpy from the plastic wrap. And now it's time for the cut. I love how this came out. I am so happy with these mountains and with these soap shapers. If you're wondering why I slant the ruler in this one, it's because I'm getting even cuts this way. I have a whole video on why I slant the ruler, so if you're interested in more information, take a look at that. I did not oven process this batch because oftentimes bigger batches will be fine without adding extra heat to them. So I just covered it with plastic wrap and then I covered it with blankets and it was fine. I made this soap a while ago, so it's kind of weird to see this soap cutter. I haven't used this one in a long time. I have a new one from Custom Craft Tools that you'll see in my videos coming up.
as I'm cutting these bars, I'm making mental notes of the holes that I need to fill later on. And I use a detail tool that's for pottery or a stylus that's for dry embossing, and I will fill these holes. For the smaller, deeper holes, I use the dry embossing stylus, and then I use the curved end of the ceramic detail tool to push the batter into the shallower holes. Those tools, along with my favorite, the palette knife, are just really nice to have on hand. I know some of you are thinking this is totally not necessary. This is just cosmetic. It doesn't matter. And you're right. It doesn't matter, but it matters to me. It's something I like doing. It makes my product feel finished. And if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of a perfectionist. <laughs> So this is fun for me. It just depends on what you like, but yeah, it's totally not necessary. Soap to me is the whole experience. It's the nourishing, it's the art, it's the function. So it's functional art and the whole experience of using it is more than just a bar of soap. That's why soap makes such a good gift. It's fairly cheap as far as gifts go, but it's a usable gift that's just a whole experience in itself. It's a usable piece of art. It's not going to sit around collecting dust. Or it shouldn't because these soaps are made to be used. Some people say it's too pretty to use, but to them I say, well, buy two and use one and display one if you want to, but I would hate for you not to have this experience because handcrafted soap is better than what you buy at the store for the most part. Most soap that you buy at the store is actually not even soap, it's detergent because they take the glycerin out and glycerin is a humectant and humectants draw moisture to you. And commercial soap companies take the glycerin out because it's valuable. That's why most commercial soaps are more drying to your skin. The byproduct of saponification is glycerin and soap. And we have no way of taking that out. So naturally a soap with glycerin left in it is going to be less drying than a soap without it. If you look at the pink mold there, that's how much soap I have left over. To calculate the weight of soap that I needed for this batch, I used 15% over the amount that I would normally use for this mold. I would take that number times 1.15 to get the actual number of soap to use because for this technique you need to scrape some soap off. So if you look at my scrapes and if you look at that amount that I had left over and you think you would rather have a bigger buffer zone than that, you can up that number to higher than 15%. Now it's time for the beveling. Again, this is not necessary, but for me, beveling not only gives a more finished look, it also gives a better feel in your hand because cured soap can be kind of sharp when you use it. So it's more of a comfort thing for me. If you're wondering how I figured the amounts for each layer, they're not equal. What it amounts to is using graph paper and counting the number of squares in each layer. I ran out of time to really explain this well, so I'm going to either make a blog post or another video or a file in my Facebook group to explain this further. So look in the top comment under the video and I will give a link to whatever platform I put this information on. So it would be on my website, in my Facebook group, or in another video on YouTube. you're new and you don't know about my Facebook group, it's for sharing and learning and asking questions. It's Tree Marie Soap Works Facebook group. Make sure you don't go to the business page. This is a group and it's a private group so you have to ask to be let in and you have to read the rules and answer the questions. If you don't answer the questions, you will be automatically declined from the group. So make sure to answer those questions and you'll be in and you can see what goes on in there. It's a nice support group. Thank you so much for joining me and have a wonderful day.